Hello and welcome to this next exercise in um, module 13. We're going to do another single factor analysis of variance. This time we'll perform an observational study, which you'll see the way that the ANOVA is, is put together, the calculations, makes no difference how the data was collected. The first exercise that we, the first video was an experimental study where we had our treatments and we applied uh, we applied our treatments to our experimental units and then we obtained the data in return. This one, an observational study, the data is already out there and we're just going to go out and pick it up. We're just going to go collect the data and then perform uh, our analysis on that data. So in this one we're looking at students in different college majors who always complain, uh, or I think that's secretly bragging, that how much how difficult their field of study is relative to another. You decide that perhaps you could use the number of hours spent studying as a proxy for the level of difficulty. The more hours spent studying, the more difficult the subject matter must be. So you survey students across three fields of study and ask them how many hours per week or per day they spend studying outside of class. And so here's our data. So what is our factor of investigation? Well, here we're studying different college majors, different fields of study. Uh, what, is, uh, what are our treatments? I have three treatments, accounting, physics, and sociology. Uh, our experimental units, those are the students that we've spoken to, and our response variable, well, our data here is measured in terms of hours uh, spent studying. So there's the breakdown of, of our, our experiment. Now let's get into uh, part A, test to determine whether there is a difference in the average number of hours spent studying between these three college majors. Okay, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna scroll down here and we'll start at the bottom here. So what is our null and alternative? Well, I have three treatments. Call this one mu A, mu B, mu C. So our null is always that all of them are equal. There's no difference in level of difficulty or no difference in average number of hours spent. The alternative is not all are equal. At least one of them is different. So now we're going to complete our, our, our full ANOVA table, just as we we did in the first exercise in the first video. So I've got a skeleton or a blank table down here, and uh, we'll just go ahead and fill this in. We'll have our treatments. We'll calculate error and total. And this, I'll just use shorthand. This is going to be sum of squares, degrees of freedom, mean square, F statistic, P value, and critical F. So we'll start in the first upper left box calculating sum of squares treatment. So I'll scroll back up here, SSTR. This is the sum across our three treatments of the difference between treatment means and the grand mean squared and, uh, and multiplied by the sample size. Now, here we have different sample sizes. Now, this is where that often instinct, I see often in students, they just right away, they want to calculate the mean of the means in order to, to determine that grand mean. In this case, that won't give you the right answer. What we need to do here is calculate a weighted average. So we'll calculate the sample size times the respective sample mean. So it'll be something like this, divided by NA plus NB plus NC. So if I just fill in those values, our sample size for, for A, it looks like we have five observations in that one, and that's a sample mean of 3.4. The next one, we have six observations times 2.8, plus the next one, we have seven observations times 3.1, divided by five plus six plus seven. So our grand mean here is going to be five times 3.4, oops, what's happening there? 5 times 3.4 plus 6 times 2.8 plus 7 times 3.1 equals divided by 5 
plus 6 plus 7 equals 30 or 3 point let's call it well they'll keep it two decimals 3.08 3.08 now just for fun let's see what it would have been if we had incorrectly just taken the mean of the means so if I had just calculated 3.4 plus 2.8 plus 3.1 divided it by 3 3.1. Oh, so it wouldn't have made that much of a difference in this case. Maybe I shouldn't have done that because because now maybe you think, oh, it doesn't really matter. In this case, I guess they're pretty close, but that's not necessarily always going to be the case. So don't count on always being able to take the mean of the mean. So you should always take that weighted average unless your means happen to be exact. Uh, sorry, unless your sample sizes happen to be exactly the same size. Okay, so we have our our mean uh, x double bar is 3.08. Let's now go ahead and we'll plug in our values and calculate SSTR. So our first sample size was 5 times, so I'm back to here, 3.4 minus 3.08 squared, plus the next one, the sample size was 6 times 2.8 minus 3.08 squared, plus, oh, I'm going to run out of room, there we go, plus our next sample size was 7 times 3.1 minus 3.08 squared. Okay, now let's go. I'm going to do this in steps. I always like to do everything in steps because less room for error, I find. So I'll calculate this first one. 3.4 minus 3.08 squared times 5. So 0 0.512 plus 2.8 minus 3.08 squared times 6, 44.7 plus 3.1 minus 3.08 squared times 7.0028 and then we just add all of these together so 0 0.0028 plus 0 0.47 plus 0 0.512 plus and so our SSTR is 0 0.98 so let's say 985 0 0.985 Okay, and degrees of freedom here, this is k minus 1. k, we had 3 treatments, so 3 minus 1 is 2. Mean square treatment is 0.985 divided by 2, 0 0.49. 0 0.49. Okay, now let's go and calculate our sum of squares error. So if we come back up here, SSE. This is adding again across our three treatments, nj minus 1 times sample variance. So here we have standard deviations. So this is going to be our first sample size is 5 minus 1 times 0.66 squared, plus our next sample size is 6 minus 1 times 0.97 squared, plus the next one, 7 minus 1 times 0 0.72 squared. Okay, and again, I'll calculate this in steps. Move this out of the way. So 5 minus 1 is 4 times 0.66 squared equals 1.74. 1.74 plus... 6 minus 1 is 5 times 0.97 squared, so 4.7 plus, and finally 7 minus 1 is 6 times 0.72 squared, 3.11. And then we just add those up, 3.11 plus 4.7 plus 
9.55 degrees of freedom nt minus k okay so nt is the total number of observations here i have 5 plus 6 plus 7 that's going to be 18 observations so 18 minus 3 treatments i have 15 degrees of freedom and so our mean squared error is 9.55 divided by 15 for 0.64. Good. Much faster this time around, I think, compared to our first video. So SST, now we just need to add up SSTR and SSE. So this is 0.985 plus 9.55, 10.54. And degrees of freedom here, nt minus 1, so that would be 18 minus 1 is 17, which is also 15 plus 2. Okay, now we want our F statistic. MSTR divided by MSE. So let's get that calculator out. 0.49 divided by 0.64. 0.76, let's call it 766, 766. Okay, and next step, uh, let's get critical value. So alpha will do 0 0.05, two degrees of freedom in the nom uh, numerator, and 15 degrees of freedom in the denominator. I'm looking at here's two, here's 15. So we'll pull out our F tables. 2 and 15. So that was 2 degrees of freedom and we need to scroll down. Oh, this is old. That's only 12. We need the next page. So here's 2 degrees of freedom and 15. So there's our block of number of critical values. Here's our probabilities. 0.05 is right there. So that gives us a critical value of 3.682. 3.682. So here's that F distribution. Critical value 3.682. That defines our rejection space. Our test statistic 0.766 is somewhere way down in here. Clearly, we do not reject based on that critical value approach. See if we can find a p-value at least an approximate p-value, so our test statistic is 0.76. If I come back and look at these values, well, 0.76 is smaller than the smallest value. The smallest value there is 0.269, and that corresponds to a probability of 0.1. So our p-value, given that our test statistic is smaller than the smallest, our test statistic, or sorry, our p-value must be larger than the largest, which is 0.1. So our p-value is something greater than 0.1. Consistent still with a failure to reject the null hypothesis. So what does that mean? Coming back up here, we are looking at the average number of hours spent studying per day as a proxy of level of difficulty. Here, we were unable to reject, do not reject this null hypothesis. I'm unable to say that there's any difference in the average, average number of hours spent studying across these three fields of study. So if it's a fair comparison as far as being a proxy for level of difficulty, we can say they're equally difficult. Stop complaining, <laughs> stop bragging about your difficulty of your field of study. Okay, so that's it. If we go to part B, perform a Fisher's LSD test if necessary. Well, Fisher's LSD test, that's the test that we would use if we were to reject the null hypotheses. If we rejected it and found not all of them are equal, well, then we would want to use Fisher's LSD to identify where does, uh, which one is different of these three treatments. Is there one or are all three of them different? Given that we failed to reject the null hypotheses, our evidence supports the claim that all three are the same, at least they're not statistically different, then clearly there's no point in doing a Fisher's LSD, which looks for a difference 
if we've already claimed that no difference exists. So uh, we don't have to do part B. No, no necessity, no reason to look for a difference because we've already shown that none exist. Okay, so that's it. We've got our calculations. We have our complete ANOVA. Uh, all of our conclusions are consistent. That's it. We're done. Thank you very much for watching. I hope it was helpful. Bye-bye.